All right, welcome guys. Uh, we are back. I am. Uh, I'm here to do an exclusive interview with my guy, Kyle Sloter of the Las Vegas Raiders. And up, here man? he is. What's up, my man? Jake, how you doing, man? Appreciate you having me. I'm good. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to have you. Um, you know, we've talked quite a bit. You know, been on what three or four times on Downtown Rams. So. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I was hoping you'd eventually be a Ram at that point, but, you know, obviously uh, rooting for you no matter where you go. Uh, we'll start off, you know, how's your uh, how's your offseason been? It's good, man. I'm uh, down here at home in Atlanta. Uh, just this is kind of home base for me, born and raised down here. So love uh, it. get to spend time with friends and family and kind of take a step back from, you know, the the long season, which uh, for me entailed 11 workouts and then getting signed in week seven or eight by the Chicago Bears and going through, uh, you know, a season with them and living in a hotel for, what, four or five months. So it's good to uh, get back, get back to my roots and kind of get back to, you know, being in a place of where I'm comfortable and um, able to work out with, you know, some familiar faces and all that kind of stuff, get ready for a, another long season. So <clears throat> I hear you, man. And you just went through, I mean, you know, a lot of people um, went through just a weird year. I mean, yeah. I always say 2020 felt like it was five years in one. It felt so long and just like never ending. Uh, what, I mean, like, how did you even get through it, man? You know, as a football player, I mean, it just, it just seems like everything was just, you know, picked through with a fine tooth comb and then to eventually, uh, you know, get signed by the bears, you know, like you said, you know, midway through the year, I try to explain to people, like, there's a lot of really good talent that's in the free agency pool because they simply can't bring these guys in for a workout, you know? So how was all of that? Yeah. So I went through free agency for the first time, got through the first three years of my contract and, um, you know, it, obviously at the time you can't foresee exactly what's going to happen with like coronavirus and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I've, I've had three really good preseasons where I've been, you know, at the top of, you know, statistically at the top of, uh, you know, all three years at the top with some of the best quarterbacks in the preseason and thinking that I'm going to have an opportunity and, you know, I've had the chance to work with a few coaches at this point and guys are somewhat familiar with me. And then, you know, coronavirus kind of happens and, you know, I'm kind of sitting at a place where, you know, everybody was, what happened was teams knew that the season was going to look a lot different than a normal year where you have OTAs and you have a, a normal training camp and all that kind of stuff. Well, we didn't have OTAs and we had an abbreviated training camp. So really what happened was the people that were on a team really just stuck on that team. So like all the free agents that, you know, didn't have a place to go, you know, I mean, I was talking to people every day. There was like 10 of us where we were like, what about us? Like <laughs> we, they just knew that, you know, you couldn't bring somebody in for a workout, which is a lot of the times they want to meet with you. They want to pick your brain, make sure that, you're good between the ears, you know, that you can throw a football, all that kind of stuff. So they'll bring you in for a workout. And they said that there were no workouts. So, you know, I'm sitting at home, didn't really, I talked to a few teams here and there, but, um, you know, nothing really, nothing really, to be honest with you, I had probably two calls in four or five months of, you know, leading up to August between March and August. And then August rolls around and all of a sudden the, the NFL says we can allow workouts, but the guys working out have to quarantine. So at that time, I get a call from the Chicago Bears, uh, which was actually my first one. I go there and uh, threw the ball well. It was probably the, I threw it well, but it was the worst one of the 11 workouts to come. Hmm. And, um, you know, I'd never done a workout before. I'd always been on a team. So yeah. didn't really know what to expect. Um, also probably a little jittery on the first one because you're, I, I'm sitting there like I haven't had a call in three, four months. So yeah. I'm like, if I don't, if I don't perform well with the Chicago bears, like, and they don't sign me, this might be it for my career. So, you know, probably a little bit jittery. And then as I'm walking off the field, uh, you know, with the, doing that workout or whatever, I get a call from the Seattle Seahawks and the Seattle Seahawks asked me to come out. And then, you know, I was the second time around. I did really well at that one. 
And then I went to, got a call as I was walking off the field there to come to Atlanta. So uh, kind of try out for the hometown team. And then went to Las Vegas, uh, which I did really well there. That was probably one of my better ones. And then um, from there, went to Tennessee, went to New York, went to, um, where was another one in there? I mean, I had 11 workouts. I went You're back. Just traveling everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I went back to, so I went to the Giants, I think, the, or the Jets the first time. Then a week later, we flew back to New York for the Jets and then ended up going, getting a call to go back to the Bears and work out for them again. I guess they liked what they saw, but at the time didn't have a need for another quarterback. They and do now. Mitchell Trubisky, right? <laughs> at the time, Mitchell Trubisky had gotten dinged up in some form or fashion, and they needed a third guy. So then I went and worked out for them, and they signed me and kept me for the rest of the year. So just kind of a weird, kind of a weird year. And you know, when I was with the Bears, very appreciative of the, of the opportunity, um, as you always are when you get the opportunity to play in the NFL. But it just kind of felt like I was in a holding pattern there. Like, you know, it, what happened with the um, Denver Broncos, uh, where they didn't have any quarterbacks available because of coronavirus. It kind of felt like once everybody was healthy and back available, because we had Foles, like we had everybody back again, Foles and Trubisky were back. Um, it kind of felt like they were holding on to me as a just in case, but didn't really need me. Yeah. So to, you know, going to free agency again, and the Raiders signed me in January. And, you know, the Raiders were really the one um, after, like, I, I like I said, I, I think during those 11 workouts, I really had been throwing the ball the best I ever had in my life. Um, I was having really, really good workouts and kind of like, you know, as a pro, you just keep getting, you know, if you're not getting better, I feel like I'm just in a different place right now than I've ever been. I'm throwing the ball really well. And, you know, at that point in the season or in my season, I guess I should say, I worked out with the, the Raiders and did really well. And Mike Mayock talked to me for a good bit and uh, their director of pro scouting, uh, Dwayne Joseph talked me, talked to me for a little bit and, you know, they, uh, they expressed some real interest in me and made me feel wanted and said that, you know, at the time when I left the workout that, you know, they really wanted to take me, but they had other needs and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, even though that happened, I really felt like that was truly the case. Like they made me feel wanted. So when they came calling for me, uh, in January, it was a pretty easy decision for me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be out in Vegas. Hey, I'm excited for you, you know, and it was a bummer to not have preseason last year because you said it, you know, you had three really good preseasons. And I mean, there's one where it was just total head scratcher where you, you, you know, were just all over the place dominating uh, with the Broncos and they didn't keep you. But then the Vikings brought you in. And that's when like that nickname Sloterhouse uh, started going around. I mean, is that what we're going to have to call you when you finally get an opportunity and you, you kill it out there? <laughs> <laughs> man, I don't know. I uh, more than anything, man. I just nicknames aside, I just need a chance, man. I just you I, do. I really just want an opportunity. Like that's the thing, man. Like I feel like all these guys, like everyone, makes a big deal. Like once those lights come on, like there's just something, there's something different. Like I wake up feeling different. Like I just, I feel, <laughs> I don't know. It just feels like where I'm supposed to be in the world, like on a football field, like behind center, like, I don't know, man. I just have always kind of been a guy that's thrived in the, I don't know if you call it adversity, but if you just in the, the chaos of it all, the, I don't know. I just, I, I like the feeling of knowing that people are not, they don't expect you to do anything. They don't, they're kind of against you They're for one, you know, one way or the other. It's just, uh, I kind of enjoy the, the thought of me going out there to prove some people wrong. <clears throat> Why? Well, I, I love it, you know, and, and I, I'm waiting for it as well. I mean, you know, you and I have had plenty of conversations about that, but you know, it's just, it's weird, man, because I mean, I'm just going to say it again because I feel like people that follow my channel are so tired of me saying this, but I feel like the young quarterback ecosystem in the NFL is so screwed up because it's just like you have Gardner Minshew, who's a sixth round pick and it's like, Nope, he's not good enough. But you know, I did a video on him being one of the most, you know, underrated quarterbacks in the NFL because he's got like what? 35 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. And if you put him on par with the other top sixth round quarterbacks in NFL history, 
Yeah. You get Tom Brady and Mark Bolger, who he's on pace to have a better career than, you know, according to the numbers. So it's just, it's funny and, and really, you know, frustrating because I see this with first rounders, you know, you look at Haskins now, all of a sudden Haskins is gone and he was a first round talent in 2019. Uh, you know, Josh Rosen, I bring up all the time. So there's a lot of truth to what you're saying and you do need a shot. And I think there's a lot of quarterbacks in this league and need a shot, but there's not a lot of quarterbacks in this league that need a shot that like have, you know, earned a shot in my book and have really, when they needed to, you know, go on the field and make something happen the preseason, they didn't just put tape on, they put highlight reels on because you, my friend, were not throwing interceptions. You weren't making any mistakes and you have everything that you need to have in this day and age to be a quarterback in the NFL. You know, you have, obviously we talked about that wrist action, like, you know, two or three podcast yeah. interviews a while ago, but yeah. you know, for real, you know, you have, you can really whip the ball. You have, you know, great velocity of, uh, you know, obviously the arm strength is there, but the mobility and just understanding, like, I, I don't look at like when I'm watching you on tape, I don't feel like I'm just watching a guy that's just, you know, oh yeah, you know, he's like playing it like a college quarterback, right? You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's YOLOing it or whatever they want to call it. You know, I don't look at it like that. Like you, you seem very confident in control and uh, I can tell you right now, I mean, I don't have to tell you cause you know, there are a lot of Vikings fans straight up that were like, start Kyle, what are you doing? You know, like, and I'm sitting there like hoping you get picked up by new England uh, or, or somebody like that. Cause I just feel like as long as you get an opportunity, you will succeed in that opportunity. And I mean, you're somebody you're humble, you know, you're not going to be like, you know, in the, uh, in the news for anything negative, you know, yeah. but at the same time, because you're so humble, I feel like people like me have to defend you and you're, you know, you're, you're 27 now. So like you, you're getting to that point where you really need a shot soon. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm impressed by just, you know, the, the work you've put in, you've been on now, you know, going into your, I think fifth team or your sixth team. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's obviously been a, a, you know, a long journey here and, you know, you're coming from, you know, Northern Colorado. You talked about, you know, last time we talked, you were a receiver, you were put at receiver, uh, right. you know, it, it's your career. I mean, they'll make a movie out of you if, if you get that opportunity. I'm just telling you that right now, like it's going to happen. Yeah, man. I, uh, you know, it's funny that so you bring up a lot of points that like, you know, I it's at a certain point, like I'm tired of living with like all these different thoughts in my head. I really just want like that opportunity so I can be like I, I can either do it or I can't like yeah. I want to either. And, and like for me, like I know that I can do it. And, and if and if I'm proven that I can't, but I feel like the things that I've done on a football field, like how many quarterbacks are like, when you look at a third string, like preseason game, yeah. when you get to, or like second string or whatever it is, like how many quarterbacks are out there just doing well? Like not many, like there's not many quarter, like typically. That's my thing. You're standing out. You're not just existing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like p typically people turn the TV off when <laughs> it's the second half or the, or the second quarter or whatever it is. Like they don't, like for Minnesota, they were turning the TV on. Like we'd come out of halftime and we had more fans in the stadium than yeah. half because they knew I was playing in the second half. They wanted to see you over Sean Mannion. I know you're not going to say anything there, but Rams fans were like, "Whoa, this Kyle Sloter can play, man!" You know, and they they heard you on my show, so they were like, "Well, oh, come on, Rams!" You know, like yeah. <laughs> Mannion was out the door, and everyone was just like, "Oh, let's see, let's see Sloter behind Goff, and let's <clears throat> let's see if he can challenge Goff." and Look, I mean, look at what Wolford's done. So I'm, I'll leave it at that. But you know where I'm going with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that the things that I've done on a football field, and then given my physical attributes, like I just feel like, you know, I, I won't go into all that stuff too much. But like, yeah. I feel like I check the boxes. Like mm -hmm. if I was, if I played at Georgia, and like had a career like I did at Northern Colorado, I would have been a first round pick. I'm six five. I run a, a four six forty. I have a good arm. I'm accurate. Like I'm smart. I feel like, I mean, I'm not going to, I'll let other people <laughs> judge me on that side of things. Well, you're not dumb. There's yeah. that. <laughs> but, I mean, like if I'd had the career that I had in Northern Colorado, I really truly believe I would have been a first round pick. And I won't even have to be fighting for my life in the NFL right now. Like I, I feel like I check the boxes, but to go back to your Gardner Minshew point, people get lost on the lore of the first round pick. Like, 
I'm going to be real with if there's any Jacksonville fan, Jacksonville fans out there watching this right now, like do it. The, the reality is like just with the big learning curve that is the NFL, like you're probably like to say that and people will probably not agree with this, but NFL quarterbacks would Gardner Minshew will be a better quarterback on Trevor Lawrence's day one of being with Jacksonville that he like, that's not to say Trevor Lawrence won't be better in after year one or year two or year three, but as he's coming into the league, like these, these college quarterbacks have no idea what they're getting themselves into. And to like say that Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson or these guys, like there are very few guys that step out there that are better than even the bottom veterans that are in the the league right now, just because they have that experience. They've seen some of the things like these guys really are going to have to like, it's going to be a whirlwind. Like nobody, very, very few quarterbacks, like really figure it out right, right away. Like you have to see some things, you have to go through some things. And that's not to say that these quarterbacks won't be great. Like I'm not telling like Jacksonville not to draft Trevor Lawrence because I think he'll be a great quarterback like for many years to come. Mm. I'm saying that he's got a ways to go. Like he's a great quarterback, but he's a great college quarterback right now. Like we haven't seen him throw a down or play a down in the NFL yet. So totally agree. You know what I mean? Like, it, and people. My point is, people get lost on the lore of the first round pick. They think that like you see so many people get chances. Like for instance, if Dwayne Haskins was a seventh round pick, he with the way he's played, he probably wouldn't be anywhere right now. Yeah, because he's a first round pick, he's going to continue to get chances and chances and chances, which. You know, that's fine. Like, it's not it's not for me to say. And you know what? Dwayne Haskins may end up being the best quarterback of all time. I'm not sitting here trying to grill him or anything like that. No, I'm, no, of course not. I'm just saying that, you know, different people learn at different paces. And I just think that some people jump the gun on, like, he's a first-round pick or he's a seventh-round pick. It should be, how good is this guy? Like, can he pick it up? It, it shouldn't be draft status-based. And that's – that's what fans don't understand is that everything is draft status based. And as an undrafted guy, I will forever have to fight that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you are, I mean, you're up for the the task. I mean, you continue to find homes in the NFL. Um, one thing I will say, and I'll ask you, you know, what were your thoughts when the XFL came around and the AAF came around? Did you consider hopping into that scenario? Because I know it's hard when you're, you're already in the NFL at this point, you've already put some good tape on, and I mean, I'm sure part of you is like, I've done enough where a coach should feel comfortable with me for the next three years as the backup and then potentially, you know, a developmental starter. Uh, but was there any kind of thought in your mind? Look, look, I see what, for instance, the guy that we've been talking about, John Wolford's doing. I see what, you know, uh, I mean, perfect example, Philip Walker. I mean, you know, he I loved him at Temple, but like he didn't get a chance really in the NFL. And he was cut like 10 different times. And then he goes to the XFL and he's like the star of the league. So like, was there, did that ever cross your mind? Yes. So it's funny you say that. So um, Oliver Luck, when I was with the Cardinals, they Mm. Oliver Luck came to me and they offered me the biggest contract in the XFL to be the highest paid guy and kind of be the face of the XFL. So, but at the time, like you're sitting there, like, you know, my agent's kind of advising me, I'll I'll say this, it's very tough. I was on the practice squad with the Cardinals for a little bit um, that year. And it's very tough to leave the NFL. Totally agree. When you're already in it and you have your foot in the door. And when I was with the Cardinals, like the Cardinals did everything that they could to try to match what the Lions were giving me. And in the end, it just, it didn't work out. Um, to try to keep me there and cliff kingsbury like love cliff kingsbury he's like one of my favorite coaches of all time and i was only there with him for like nine weeks ten weeks but he's a uh, love cliff cliff kingsbury he wanted me to stay there but ultimately he wanted me to go you know possibly have a chance to play with the detroit lions because i was one play away i was the backup there yeah but the xfl came to me and asked me to be a starter for one of their and they offered me a, a nice salary and all that kind of stuff and you know they were i I think the the best way to put it is it's just tough to leave because like at the end of the day it's not really about the money as much as it is like prove like i want to be i want to be the best football player of all time not the richest football player of all time like yeah 
so at the time, like on the practice squad, they were offering me much more than I was making on the practice squad. And then once mm -hmm. I got pumped up to active, then it was much more than what the XFL was offering. But at the same time, it's, uh, I don't know. It was, it was tough to, it was tough to say no for sure, because like I miss playing the game, but there's still a part of me that just has hope that like, you know, I've been through all this for a reason. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty like devout Christian. Um, I believe in, you know, everything happens for a reason, all that kind of stuff. And I just kind of feel like all this stuff, all this adversity that, that I've been going through that, you know, a lot of people haven't made it through that I'm, I'm still going through it today. And I still, like you said, keep finding homes and all that kind of stuff because like, there's a reason for like, something is going to happen from all of it, whether it's, whether it's football re related or not, I don't know. It just kind of felt like the NFL is where I was supposed to be. And I didn't quite have that call in my, my gut feeling to like go to the XFL. Not to say that it would have been, it's not that I looked down on the XFL because I don't ever look down on playing. Like I want to play. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's just, it's tough to, cause you don't, it's so hard to get your foot in the door in the NFL. Everybody's trying their whole career to get in the NFL and it would be hard to leave it if you catch what I'm saying. Well, that's the thing. I totally understand that. And that's why like to preface that I was like, you know, you could have done that, but you were already in the NFL. I, it's different for a guy like John Wolford who had been caught by the jets. And at that point he's feeling maybe in my time, in the NFL's done. It's yeah. different for a guy like Philip Walker, who I said was cut 10 times. He's probably thinking maybe my time in the NFL is done And Jordan Tayamu, I don't know why. I mean, I had him as a top 10 quarterback. I had you as a top five quarterback in your draft. Uh, Tayamu got like no opportunity. I think he was with the, the Texans for a little bit and then they cut him and mm -hmm. then he couldn't find another gig. And then, you know, sure enough, the XFL came around. They're like, Hey, we want you to be like one of the faces. Yep. And, you know, I just feel like it's so much easier. Well, it is easier to, you know, accept a job when you don't have a job <laughs> than it is when you have one. Yes. And it's, it's at literally the mountaintop. I mean, this is, this is the Mecca. This is the NFL. So I don't blame you at all. Um, yeah. And there's the argument to be made that you go get good film and then that kind of propels your career. Well, you you have that. good film against the NFL talent in the preseason, you know? That's what I'm saying. Like those, a lot of those guys that you're playing in second and third string, like are still in the NFL. And if they do go to the XFL, they're the best ones and they make it back to the NFL. So it's just, I don't know. It was, and that's a, that's the other argument to be made. Like people always say, like you're playing against third stringers. Well, I'm playing with third stringers as well. But every single person on that field is also first team All SEC, first team All Big Ten. Like nobody out there is bad. Like everybody thinks like third string, like you're bad. Like everybody's the best in the world. So like, I know. So like that argument to be made, like it doesn't make any sense at all. To oh, me. Like, it's so hard to hear, especially you. You hear it all the time. Yeah. And I think people have just gotten accustomed to just saying the word trash. But I mean, like I put so much effort into like watching film and trying to break it down. You put in so much effort to trying to be the best quarterback you can be. Yeah. Isn't trash just saying that calling a player trash or like a bum. Is that the, like the most, like just, like, it just screams ignorance to me. You know what well, I mean? Well, for the guy on the couch to be saying that, you know, <laughs> quarterback is for, like, I mean, what are we talking about here? It, yeah, I know it, it's so often, but I, I mean, all the time. I mean, it yeah. is all the time. But it's all people in, love that word. Yeah, but in reality, like I had a what's her name, Courtney Cronin for ESPN, who covered the Vikings, was like standing up at in one interview I was sent where she was like screaming, like could not believe that I was even a topic of conversation, like saying I'm terrible because I play against third stringers, and I'm like, what? Yeah, I'm like, lady. We, I, when, a, when an NFL starting quarterback is preparing for a game, like he gets every single rep at practice. He gets every rep that he's going to run in that game at practice. He has maybe three coaches in the film room with him, like coaching him through every single thing. What are we going to do? We have an, a specific game plan for me. I got no reps at practice ever. I got no reps. Denver was the only place I ever got reps. So in Minnesota for two years, I went out and played preseason games. And the first time I had thrown the ball that week, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I got about 12 reps a week, which Kirk Cousins got about 250. So 
So I got 12 reps a week and half of those are run plays. So I'm throwing the ball probably six times in 11 on 11 a week. And then you have to go out there and play a game. And I would say 80% of the plays are plays that I've never run before. Like I've seen them before. I've never run them. Like I, how many times do you see an NFL starting quarterback running plays in a game that he has never run before that he's only seen? Never. I'll tell never. you that. It can't never. happen. And then I'm going out there with guys who also have never had any reps. So like, would you rather go out there with a game plan against better competition or no game plan? Guys just running around with their heads cut off and making plays. <laughs> like, so, I mean, there's an argument to be made both ways. So uh, to say that like you're playing against bad competition, that's ridiculous. And then to also say, you're playing third string, like it, it's pretty tough. So I, either way, like you can, you can bash it either way, but I, I man, my I, thoughts. I'm so glad I didn't see that. I've been trying to stay like, you know, more low key on Twitter lately. Um, but I think I would have just gone off my rocker. <laughs> like I would have just lost it. Courtney Cronin is not on my, my mom's good side right now. I'll say that Ooh. It, it's been about two years. So she's still, <laughs> I mean, that's my mom in general. You know, you could have an ex-girlfriend from five years ago and she's just like, nope, she's dead to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, you're, I, I haven't thought about it for a single day except for right now. But my my mom, is like, you know, you, you talk about your kid. like, Oh, yeah. Kid. You know, you talk about me. Who cares? But she, you talk about her kid. Like, she's going to hold a grudge. So that's just her. It's probably going to be all. I love this. <laughs> Oh man. No, I, I hear you. And that's, that's so frustrating. Um, that man, I'm like pissed off now. <laughs> oh, I don't want that to be the tone of the interview. You know what I'm saying? Like, I yeah, just, no, no. Just, you know, we're just talking about things, you know? Yeah, of course. Just having a conversation. Yeah. Um, now I want to get your thoughts though, because the NFL now is going to have a 17 game regular season Yes. And I feel like this kind of hurts, you know, people like you trying to, you know, again, put more film out there, get those reps in preseason. They're getting in a preseason game, which I call them developmental preseason games, because yes. I think this is the best opportunity for a rookie or an undrafted rookie free agent or a guy that's kind of. And this is another thing that I think you've brought up before. Just because a guy became a backup quarterback, and I think you talked about this in college, like it's all dependent on like the coach. So like, you know, you could have one coach views you as the star of the team and yeah. is going to make you the quarterback in college. And then the other one views you as a wide receiver. Or I forget that. I think that was along the lines of what we were talking about. Yeah. And it's like, that's the thing. Like people don't understand, like you could look at, you know, previously, what was it? Devin Funches, right? Like he opted out last year. Uh, COVID opt out didn't play, but he's with the Packers. And I think he's going to emerge this year and have a really good year. But like he was supposed to be like this up and coming guy with Carolina and they fire Ron Rivera. And now all of a sudden, like he doesn't have like that. It's a new regime. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like, that's the league in a nutshell. You know, I look at, uh, you know, a quarterback like Josh Rosen, perfect example. He oh, fell man. into that same trap, you know, where, you know, they get Cliff Kingsbury. And I don't blame Cliff for a second. He wanted his guy. But unfortunately, because Josh Rosen is drafted by, uh, you know, the, um, I can't remember his name, Steve Wilkes regime. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that lasted literally one year and they were done with him. Uh, I, I just think it's it's one of those frustrating things, you know. And then not to mention, we talk about you have all different coordinators. You know, for a defensive, uh, say you're a linebacker and you have to, Oh, well, we're going to go from a 3-4 to a 4-3 and then fire that guy, go back to a 3-4. And then on the offensive side, we're going to be like, yeah, we're going to run more of a, a spread offense. No, we're going to go more run heavy. We're going to go dink and dunk. We're going to go for the big, like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, I can say Sam Bradford, perfect example. I know I'm bringing up all these, like, top picks, but yeah. it's just showing you, like, in the league, like, how everyone's like, oh, they're, they're a backup. It's like, yeah, but like Sam Bradford, like, I mean, it, not yeah. the greatest example, but like he probably could have been a lot better if not for two things, the knee injuries. Yes. And on top of that, I mean, I think everybody would say that. And then on top of that, he five different OCs. Like, how can you develop as a quarterback with five different OCs? But then again, you're doing it all like you're doing all sorts of stuff with like, I feel like it's a new coach or a new team or a new system. Uh, and you just continue to, to truck it out. And 
I literally cannot wait for your, your preseason game. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be watching that with like popcorn and everything like room for my guy, you know? Yeah. So hopefully you get a chance to throw some touchdowns to uh, Henry Ruggs, the third, cause he was my number one receiver last year. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I hope so, man. No, I, I agree. So to go along with that. So I've had seven different offensive coordinators. Um, so I know exactly, I know that the toll that that can have. So like, yeah, speaking from experience like i was with sam bradford like sam bradford was one of the most talented guys that i was with like he you talk about just like he didn't have an arm that like wowed you but like he had something um in the sense of like touch and accuracy that nobody i've seen has like hmm. he he had more like he could float a pass um I don't know, 30 yards on the money in stride. Like he, he just like was that accurate kind of guy. Like he wasn't ever going to blow you away with like a rocket arm, but like he was, there's a, he throws a pass in his first, it was my first game with the Vikings on Monday night football week one, 2017. He throws a pass to Jarius Wright. Um, I believe on third down against the saints um going left to right on a deep cross with a defender like right in front of Jarius Wright and he lays it just like over the top in the only place that it could possibly be and the guy I mean and he did that all game I'm gonna call you Sean McVay from now on <laughs> but he, he did that all I mean he he was incredible like he just had like a different kind of touch about him and so I'll say this he found a home in Minnesota, he just had knee injuries. And if he yeah. had had that, they would if he had had that whole season, he would have been there and he would still be there and he would be one of the better quarterbacks in the league because it is the NFL is so much about like and maybe that's why a lot of these guys continue to get chances like these uh, the first rounders uh it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. They continue to get chances because a lot of these guys, they just don't fit in the scheme that they're drafted into. Like they have the talent and the ability, but like fitting in a place and like meshing with the coach on like a personal level, as well as a scheme level, it's more scheme, but you know, you still want to have like that chemistry with your coach. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then like <clears throat> you get coaches get fired, all that kind of stuff. Like, coaches like not in a bad way like i don't want this to come out in a negative way but they have like arrogance is, isn't probably the correct word but they have like this arrogance about them that they want their guys to to do well like i picked him um, oh i know a guy that first name that comes to mind can you guess <laughs> i'm trying to think uh no give it to me Taysom hill <laughs> for sure that is Sean Payton's guy. He will go to bat for all day. Oh, for sure. I mean, well, I mean, they they're fighting with that. They're fighting two battles. They're fighting the battle that he's worth what they paid him now because it's there's that, and then you also want to look like the next like he changed football with like that scheme in that position. So like, it's not to say like everybody wants to leave their mark on the game. Like it's yeah. Not, not a negative thing to like have a coach that wants his guy or be responsible for like you know who's a quarterback that so like with John Gruden is my guy right now my head coach and Sorry, I was gonna say Mariota is the guy that I felt like wasn't drafted in the right offense at all for sure um but the immediate one that I was thinking of was Brad Johnson Brad Johnson went to Tampa Bay and yeah and they meshed and it like he'd had success other places but he'd found like his home in Tampa Bay with John Gruden. So like everything is about fit. Like you have to fit into a, a scheme. And then there's also coaches that just like, for whatever reason, whether it's your personalities, like you guys just love each other. Like you guys are just like bros and you guys hit it off and they want you to be great. And they, you guys work together. And then, you know, and then there's some relationships where like one guy thinks one way and one guy's a certain, a, a different way. Like you might have like a guy like a, uh, Zimmer, who's like an old school guy, and then like, you know, me, who's like a kind of a happy-go-lucky. Like, I'm not like the type of quarterback that's going to come in there and just be like, 
all serious, all business all the time. Like I like to have fun with my job and what I do. Like I'm passionate about it. Like I'm going to have fun doing it. Yeah. Uh, not to say that me and him didn't get along. We did. But, um, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe that I, for my part, I liked him, but who knows? Maybe my personality didn't mesh with his. So I think that that's a real thing. So, you know, it's, uh, I think finding the right scheme for guys is very important. So I'm, I'm looking for that. You know? I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, I, I love that you brought that up with the personality thing because yeah, there, there's an inner arrogance or maybe an outer arrogance with some coaches. Uh, you know, I mean, Hey, you know, Jeff Fisher was the Rams football coach for, um, you know, a while. And there were times where they would have certain players that, you know, the fans could see and correct me if this is the wrong thing to say, but I almost feel like there's sometimes coaches are too close to the game where they miss guys like you that are clearly they deserve to be playing. And it almost seems like they're they're too close to the game. So they have this archetype of what they were looking for, you know, back 10 years ago and they haven't changed their ways. Is that fair to say in this league? Um, yes and no. Um, I would say that. So like. I haven't experienced a coach that like is no in no way going to change. Hmm. Like I have, um, you know, and, and I, I think the closest to that would be like, and I think he has changed a lot in like his, so I don't want to say that I found like somebody that ha won't change at all because that's not true. I think every, I think in this league you adapt or you die. So I think that there's definitely some coaches that like want to run their stuff more than listen to like, uh, I think that happens. Like, you know, you want to run my, I want to run my playbook. I'm the coach. I want to run my playbook, which is fine. Like, you know, it happened know, with Chip Kelly and well, yeah, he's not like, in the NFL anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and if it doesn't work, then I guess at the end of the day, all you can do is like, you know, if, if it's just on me, like that's something that like I've always, as a quarterback, like if I've, that's why I just want the opportunity to play is because like, if I'm just not good enough, I can, I can live with myself not being good enough and just like take that on the chin and be like, okay, I just wasn't good enough. Like, that's fine. But like, I think the part that kills me is um, not knowing, like not knowing how good I could be. So like, I think that that's same thing for coaches. Like I think coaches really just like run their stuff or like if they won't change, it's typically like something like that where they want to run their stuff and at the end of the day if they lose then they can say that i'm either I either made my job you know i've been here for a long time I, i've made it work here for a long time or i didn't based on my own merit so i think that but most coaches like i really don't think you get to this level of coaching without being able to like somewhat adapt i think like players themselves slip through the cracks because of the draft and all this other kind of stuff and i think preconceived notions and all that kind of stuff as opposed to just like x's and o's how does he play like all that kind of stuff i think players slip through the cracks but i don't necessarily think that like i think people change some change more than others like i'll say this cliff kingsbury like I said, he's one of my favorite coaches. Cliff Kingsbury will be the first person to tell you that like 50% of his playbook, like week to week is like taken from other teams. <laughs> like we used to take the best plays, like the most explosive plays. We used to watch, it was almost like a top 10 highlight, like on ESPN. We used to take like the 10 most explosive plays of like the week and like install them into our offense. And the funny thing was, is like, that was my first time really seeing that done as a football player because normally like coaches want to do their stuff. Um, that was the first time I've ever seen that. In my first week I was there, I was like, this doesn't seem like it's going to work. <laughs> like, but like it's, it doesn't feel like, like you can't just take plays and not know the coaching points and all that kind of stuff and then work. They worked every time. <laughs> Literally our most explosive plays every week were the ones that Cliff Kingsbury picked out and we're like, hey, we're going to run these. And they worked every time. And, like, at a certain point, you got to give the guy credit for, like, he tells people, he's like, yeah, I take most, I take a ton of my plays from other people. And he's not ashamed of it. He's just, It's just good coaching. McVay does it, too. I yeah. mean, I'll tell you right now, uh, it seems like the thing that really 
like highlights over Sean McVay mm. is when he gets beat by a certain team. So I said immediately once he lost to Vic Fangio in 2018, had forced Goff to throw four interceptions. You have that single high safety in Eddie Jackson, who, I mean, in Vic Fangio's scheme, he will be the most dominant safety in the league. And now he's with Chuck Pagano, and I, I think Pagano's really good, but he yeah. doesn't have him used in the same way. And so <clears throat> I was just watching, like, you know, him interact, and then you had, you know, Amuka Mara and, and Kyle Fuller on the boundary, and then you had Buster Screen in the slot. And it was like, like I saw with Bradford, for instance, like he tried to get it in between. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a bad decision. It's just yeah. Eddie Jackson was a freak of nature and could run a four three. And while he was in the middle of the field, he saw, you know, Bradford's trying to hit Larry Fitzgerald down the left sideline. And he's, he's got a step or two on Fuller, but it, it basically Eddie Jackson baited him. He cuts him off and gets the pick. Yeah. And so, I felt like when Goff went against this defense, when Sean McVay went against this defense, and they failed miserably. It was the first time all year that anybody had made them look that bad. Yeah, I think that was, first off, the beginning of the end for the Goff-McVay era. Because I will say this, McVay had the whole league you know, trying to figure out how to stop him. And then McFangio's like, this is how you stop him. And he created the blueprint. And you saw that in the Super Bowl, the quarters coverage, uh, you yeah. know, with uh, Brian Flores as the defense coordinator with Bill Belichick in New England. And he just did an incredible job of just shutting them down. But I guess, like, what I'm getting at here is, you know, McVay, he also in 2019 was still kind of doing the same things. But then, you know, a certain player uh, by the name of Lamar Jackson kind of took over and won the MVP. And I noticed he started picking you know, parts of that Ravens offense and adding it to this Rams offense this year. Yeah. And so I feel like, so what you're saying, and I know there's a play, the exact play I can tell you, uh, when the Chiefs ran this, um, it was like a post to, you know, post over the middle, like a seam buster to Kareem Hunt. Yep. And uh, the Rams ran it like the next week against Dallas in 2017. Like, McVeigh is constantly doing that. So when you say like Kingsbury is doing that, I feel like like that's like I'm not surprised at all. You know, I think Shanahan's probably doing it. Yes. There's probably a lot of OCs that are doing it. So it's a copycat league, man. You either like you said, adapt or die. And you could be the old school punch in the mouth, 80s offense where you just run the football, but I just don't think that's gonna work. Now yeah. I'm intrigued to see your former team, the Lions, because you know, they, they let Stafford go uh, via trade. They got decent compensation for him. Plus, they got Jared Goff. And I'm, you know, different between kind of like I've been very critical of Goff, but I know what he's capable of. And I honestly think as great as McVay was, I feel like they had just kind of reached a point where they couldn't mesh anymore. And yep. I feel like, you know, there, there comes a point where you need a change of scenery. And I feel like Goff, will, it's interesting to me, like what he could be yep. with uh, Detroit. And I also think that Dan Campbell is going to be a really good head coach. I love that. Like everyone was getting on him about his like biting. Yeah, I forget what it was like eating ankles or something. Yes. But like, I think the guy can coach. Go back and, and look what he did, you know, with Miami, you know, when he became the interim head coach. And that there was like this uh, thing that went around uh, that he was doing Alabama drills and like he got in trouble for it. But it, yeah. he, he even said like that was just that was hogwash. That was never happening or whatever. Yeah. And I think they went, what, five and six or whatever. Like, I thought he did a nice job of keeping them above water. Sure. Um, but, I mean, I'm excited to see that. And I think this season, it, you know, we're going to see a lot. And I think it's also funny. I'm just going off on a tangent here. But, like, the more and more I think of, and it's like, with you, Kyle, you have actually been really connected to a lot of these these former Rams. I mean, Bradford, Case Keenum. Uh, yeah. You play with Stafford now. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's pretty crazy. I think your OC, if, if he's still there, it's Greg Olson, right? Yes. Uh, he's you're still talking, there. You're talking about in Vegas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and we like Greg Olson because, you know, the, good guy. the guy's actually, he was with the St. Louis Rams. Was he? So he yeah. He was there. Okay. What, when was he there? He was there early on, like not early on, but like mid I want to say late 2000s, mid 2000s. I, I don't remember exactly. It might be like 2006 or something. Okay. But he came back uh, and was the OC, yeah. I think, for 2017. And then he went to the Raiders. So 
Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I'm fired up to work with him. He uh, he ran my workout when I was out there. Um, he's reached out to me a couple times, uh, talked with him on the phone, uh, Zoomed with him, all that kind of stuff. And he just seems like a, a really, like, relaxed kind of guy. Um, maybe, like, could get after you a little bit if you're having one of those days. But he seems like a really cool guy um, between him and, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of the – uh, hard knock stuff from because I, I hadn't really didn't really pay attention but wanted to go back and watch and see all like the coaches mannerisms and all that kind of stuff see what they like what they don't like just, i like that you're scouting the coaches <laughs> yeah just doing my homework well i mean you know it's, it's kind of true what they say like especially in this league like you don't have time to make your own mistakes you got to learn from other people's so i'm just trying to uh you know kind of pick up on things that you know coaches do and don't like just to, you know, give myself a little bit of an advantage there, whether it's like a certain read or a certain way you carry yourself or whatever it is. But between him and Coach Gruden, like, they just seem like like cool guys to, like, hang out with and, like, ha get a beer with, you know? Like, they just, yeah. like, they're – like, Gruden's a hard ass, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, like, you see the way he interacts with his players and you see, like, how they actually care about him and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's just cool to see – you know, that, that side of a coach um, and see how he gets really close with his players. I think he's also one of the few coaches that has like a ton of like experience and security. You know, a lot of guys are, you know, he has, he got that big contract uh, to start with like for 10 years, but he's, he's not going anywhere. So like, you know, to have the ability to like have that kind of security and um, be able to get close with your players, whereas some coaches are like, I've only, I can only be a hard ass because like I've got to make it every year, just like a player. Yeah. That's a good you know, point. It's, it's a, uh, I'm excited to work with them. And then to like, just see like between which hard knocks isn't a good, I've, I've had the playbook in my hands for a couple months now. And um, you know, just to see like the, I think most places I've been most concepts at year five in the NFL you've kind of seen most plays like that's the easy part about transitioning from offense to offense is that all the plays there's, there's nothing different. Everybody runs the same stuff. Like nobody's running anything. That's just like groundbreaking different. Like it's all the same stuff. It's just called something different. Yeah. But in Gruden's playbook, his playbook is the first one where like, I'm actually seeing like different concepts. And it's, it's cool to me. Like it's, it's helping me grow like my, I don't know. I've got like seven different coaches in my head right now of like knowledge where like I've just been, I think that's a weapon. I think that that's something that's valuable that a lot Absolutely. Of because some people see like, you know, obviously Tom Brady's the best quarterback to ever play, but he spent most of his time with the same few people. So whether it was McDaniels or, you know, Bruce Arians now, but, you know, he's spent the same – he's been with Belichick his whole career. So, to, you know, be with the same few people, it's it's great to have the familiarity with the offense, but it's also really nice in my instance to – I've seen football from every different angle. Like, I've seen different coaches and, you know, their philosophies, and I feel like I've been able to take the things that I feel like are good coaching points and things that I don't like quite as much that don't work for me. And then just kind of like blend everything together. And, uh, you know, I feel like I have a pretty good general football knowledge just from being with a bunch of different people. So excited to work with those guys. I think that, you know, going through that playbook, that that's something that, you know, is, is pretty special. I, th I think that there's not a lot of people that, you know, think like John Gruden. Like he's I, – I can't speak from experience with him because I haven't dealt with him quite yet, but – Sounds like he's a football genius, and I'm just really blessed and excited. That was one of the big reasons why I wanted to be in Vegas. So, and it's Vegas. Like, come on now. <laughs> um, but it's X. Yeah. Well, here's uh, here's another thing I'll ask you. Uh, because I haven't quite said this, and actually, I've been seeing there was a comment. I forget who posted. I think it was Renee House who, because I mean, we're live. Um. And it was a it was a good point. It was like basically you are by going into all these buildings, learning the playbooks and everything, learning different concepts. 
you're kind of molding yourself into, you know, potentially having a career after your playing career. Are you interested in coaching after your playing career is up? Um, you know, I get asked that a lot and, uh, you know, I, that, that's like, that's a big question to unpack for me Yeah, because like some people love football so much that there's no, like, I'm one of those people, but when you are a head football coach or you're an offense coordinator in the NFL or you're, so like I'll lay it out in two different ways. So in the NFL, those guys get a little bit of time off, but they don't get a lot. Like they don't have like, they have families, but it's not like they're present all the time. Like they have so much going on in their own lives. Like those guys, like this is something I don't think a lot of people understand is like players get a day off. Like we get one day off a week during season. Those guys don't like they're there seven days a week. Like they're there from five 30 in the morning to 10 at night. They, they're getting four or five hours of sleep. Like it is like, you think bye weeks are for the players. Like bye weeks are for those coaches. Like those guys are dead. Like they sleep, they hibernate for seven days during bye weeks. Like they work so hard. They break down so much film. It takes so much time between that like and now that you're in the nfl you don't even see the side where they're doing all the the prospect recruiting and talking to those guys and like we don't even see that side of it now they're driving like right now they're flying to pro days they're going to the combine they're going to the draft like they're doing so much it's like the family life is non-existent almost so like and then you go to college which is the other high level that you could go to to potentially you know that's those guys, they are there year round. They don't even get a break because their break is flying across the country to recruit. Like at least NFL, they have personnel and scouts all over the nation that they pay within their organization. Like for a college football team, your offensive coordinator, your quarterback coach, your offensive line coach, your wide receivers coach, like they are your recruiters. They're going to see hundreds and hundreds of kids each year in their homes going to their high schools, going to their spring games, going to their games. Like they might have a, uh, a Friday night game that they got to go to that they fly out for, and then they fly back on a red eye or like a private plane or something to get back for their college game. Like it on Saturday, like it's nuts. So like for me, I think one of the things that I value or will value is like I want to have like a family and be a very present like dad and all that kind of stuff and like I don't know it, it's it's so much move because you know a coach a head coach gets fired which will happen like no coach leaves like everyone gets fired in this profession you, and, yeah in coaching and playing like everyone gets fired I've been fired three times so like everyone gets fired it just happens it's inevitable like Tom Brady one day like it seems impossible but Tom Brady one day he'll probably retire but behind the scenes like if he ever starts falling off they're probably going to be like hey man like you can either retire or we're moving on like yeah everyone that happens to everyone like Peyton Manning was kind of starting to lose it towards the end a little bit like great quarterback don't get me wrong but he had no feeling in his fingertips nobody knows that like he had no feeling from that yeah that's he had no finger and feeling in his fingertips. So he's throwing a football, which is amazing to me, with no feeling in his hands. So at Crazy. a certain point, you're just like, hey, dude, like, we got to move on. So, like, everyone in this business gets fired at some point. So, like, the instability of having to move around and pick up a family and all that kind of stuff. And, like, I got a, a, a finance degree that I'm pretty proud of. And I kind of always wanted to get into business and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I've always said that, so this is the side of coaching that I would do if I was ever lucky enough to play football for long enough that I could give my family whatever they need to survive and put food on the table and all that kind of stuff and was in a fortunate enough position, I would go do high school football coaching and like just be a head, head coach somewhere because you don't have to worry about like the recruiting. You don't have to, it's just football. It's just this purest form of let's go out there and play some ball for, you know, a, a semester of the, the season. Like you go out there for fall and then you're done and then you can have a family. Like if I get fired, then I'm like, okay, I'll just go home and be with my family. Like, I don't yeah. have to go anywhere. Like, so I think that's really the only, the only other way would be. So like, you know, Austin Davis, like the quarterback coach for uh, Seattle. 
Uh, he's he, the quarterback coach for Seattle now. Yes, but he was a. He's like one of my favorite quarterbacks. <laughs> he was a quarterback for um, St. Louis Rams back in the day. Yeah, it was. He he was literally a position coach making great money, like all that kind of stuff, which like most people, like a guy like me in the NFL, unless I like have like some crazy career, like a, I don't know, like not hall of fame, but like something kind of close to that. Like you're not going to come in and just be the quarterback coach. Like it's very rare for like what Austin Davis did. Yeah. So like, unless I'm like super fast tracked to like, a, a a job that I can't refuse because most of the time you have to go in there and like be like the coach's like personal assistant, like something like that. Like go make me copies, go get me coffee, like all that kind of stuff. Like you gotta earn <laughs> way. Like I'm not trying to do all that. Like if they wanted me to be a coach, like they would have to offer me a coach's position, which I don't think they would do at this point in my career. I would have to go probably to college or I could go do the high school head coach kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, it's a, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a very, like, I'm just ambitious. Like I've just got like outside yeah. of football, I've got so many like different ideas and all that kind of stuff. And like love football. It's my passion. Like I said, I don't, I, that's the place on the, like, that's where I feel at peace is like in amongst that chaos, like playing out on that field. But I just have like a passion to do something else as well like i, I want to prove it to myself that i can make it in the world as like just a regular dude that's not an athlete like and do well for myself like i think i can do that yeah so i get that 100 percent. i mean i was i always thought it was funny uh the kicker for the jets he was with the rams he actually kicked in uh the 2017 playoff sam ficken when greg zerline went down he was uh he was in finance i believe he right. like they were telling him just go like they were rooting for him, you know? And he's like, yeah. I never thought I was going to get a chance again. So this is cool. You know? And he was so yeah. like nonchalant about it because he had already given up on the NFL, you yeah. know? And then all of a sudden the Rams come calling and they're like, yeah, you're going to be kicking the, the playoffs. And it's, and he made it, he made one, one field goal and he made it. I mean, they lost, but uh, yeah, now he's still in the NFL. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I think people forget that. Like people forget, like, like you're also a human being too. You know what I mean? Like it's, you're, okay. <laughs> you know, like we both breathe the same air. Like obviously you're way more talented at throwing the football than I am, but you know, we wake up to the same air, the same sky, you know, like yep. green grass and blue, you know, it's like people, like sometimes people don't like, they act like you guys are like, you're constantly like, Oh, well you like, you're studying. You know what I mean? It's like, I, and don't get me wrong. I know from like just from what I've I've heard from you from other people, and then obviously from yourself, you put in the work. So I'm not saying like you don't put in the work, but I feel like there's there's fans that are so like attached to this game where they think like people are nonstop working to the point where like if you have social media, well he's just not he's not into it enough, or he's not he's not bought in, or then you know like Michael Brockers has his own YouTube, and people were like crapping on him for that. Or like uh, Russell Okung, I, I don't know if you've seen his tweets about Bitcoin, but like he's like the first player in NFL history to get paid in Bitcoin. Right now, he's reaping the rewards. Yeah. Um, but there are a bunch of people who say, "Oh, he's just too focused on cryptocurrency." And I'm like, "Come on, <laughs> like, yeah. this is a starting left tackle in the NFL." And these people are like, you know, it's just like, what do you, what do you say to that? Because you're probably sitting there like, like you, you hear these talk shows, yeah. and don't get me wrong. I'm I'm all for the talk shows because the talk shows are what keep people coming back to my YouTube channel because they're tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. Like, oh, Baker Mayfield, you know, he's a backwards hack kind of guy. And he oh, he saw aliens the other day. My quarterback doesn't see aliens, you know, yeah. and it's it just at some point or another, you just have to laugh at it all. Yeah, I mean, it's just like I think one thing I was it's funny you say that is because I was just talking with my parents yesterday about like how in professional sports people like dehumanize like the profession like they don't it's some people don't realize that we're still like you still have emotions and feelings and all that kind of stuff like you know it just because like you're i don't know it's, it's like people don't think that you'll ever see like the stuff that is said about them or like 
Because, like, imagine if you woke up every day to somebody, like, trashing you. Like, somebody, you have no idea who they are. They don't know who you are. They don't know your character. Like, I get that sometimes, but I every day. <laughs> but, yeah, but, like, every day you wake up to literally someone tagging you in something on Twitter or on Instagram or something just, like, absolutely trashing you and your passion and something that you put a lot of time and effort into. And like, if you're, if, if like we play bad or something like that, like you don't think we're the first people to know that. Like, we don't need other people like coming and telling me that I played bad or that I suck or like, any, like, cause I know like if I, if I played bad, I promise you nobody is more upset than myself. Like I'm my biggest critic. Like I, I want to play good. I want to be good. So like, I think people dehumanize like professional athletes as a whole. And it's really sad to see because like, you know, it's just because you're, they tell you brush off things and all that kind of stuff. And you, you have to, like, you get good at like seeing things and like, you know, at, the, at a certain point you've proven people wrong enough to where like people, like what they say doesn't really matter. And you know that they don't know you and they're just kind of like those trolls on the internet, but yeah, I don't know, man. It's, it's kind of, we were watching, um, we're watching bat professional basketball of some sort. And I, I, somebody was saying something like one of the broadcasters. And I was just like, that's, it's so wrong to like, say that. was it the Russell Westbrook thing that's going around? Maybe I, I can't remember, but it's, like, oh my God, it's so nuts. They do not respect greatness. Oh yeah. Well, I, I just don't like, yeah. Oh, I'm right. But like, <laughs> I just don't understand how you could say something about like, would you say that to just a dude on the street? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, you, absolutely. Would you That's say exactly that? what it is. Would you say that you, okay. So, so you're trashing Kyle Sloter. I mean, maybe that, that one lady that you brought up, she clearly was okay with saying that on the street, but like uh, she was okay with saying it in her profession, no less, but you know, like for you guys watching, like, are you just going to go up to like your least fair player and just like say like I hate you or like you're trash or something because like look I have plenty of players that I get I got on Goff's case but I met Jared Goff okay like I he's a nice dude like I have no issues with him like you know what I mean like yes that, but saying something about his game like saying in, in a non like if someone told me like hey Kyle is not like completing the ball at a high clip right now like that's that's knowledge like, yeah that, exactly i can see that for myself but when there's you some look, guys that would flip out about that but yeah, you're not but, one of them but when you start talking about like my family and that kind of stuff that's talking about like it's ridiculous who, like, man person and all that kind of stuff and like i you know it, it's just it it'll never end but it's just not like, as cancel culture ramps up my man like oh yeah. ridiculous it's it's all it's all joke. I will say, um, you know, I, I have some experience with that. I had some cornballs uh, in uh, downtown Rams community, kind of the Rams Twitter. Uh, yeah. They made not only a a fake account of downtown Rams and then my downtown sports network, but then they made a fake account of me. So every day I used to wake up and I'd see my face, yeah. you know, like photoshopped onto some dude or something and yeah, yeah. you can have an idea where we're going with that so <laughs> i i kind of get what you're saying i mean i'm not a professional athlete so i'm not gonna for a second say oh i oh, i awesome. get more hate than you do but like i definitely have a feeling of that and i feel like that you know that definitely resonates with me when you were talking about your passion because like this is my passion like i enjoy talking to people like you getting to you know build a friendship with people like you and and you know i mean there's not many people like you let me just let me point this out, okay? Because I've interviewed over 400 people and you are very down to earth. And I think that's something that, you know, my viewers, listeners need to know because like this is the guy, if if you want to root for anybody to get a shot and like start in the NFL, it's this guy right here. Like, I, I mean, there, there, there's no, there, there are guys that I've met. Don't get me wrong. There, there are a ton of guys out there that I really like. But I mean, as far as guys that are in your situation, like you you truly deserve it. Like you're, you're the good guy that people should be rooting for. Like I, I stand by that. I appreciate that. Hopefully it, uh, I don't know. I hopefully, you know, I've, I've always just kind of tried to, you know, be a, a decent person and hope for the, the best in terms of, 
at a low power here on my, my phone. Yeah. Uh, you know, hope for the best in terms of somebody, you know, giving me that opportunity, that shot, but no, I appreciate it. I, uh, I just try to, you know, remember that we're all the same, I guess. I like it. That was going to be me wrapping it up. So the phone thing, that was perfect. Uh, hey, man, really appreciate taking the time. Uh, we'll have to uh, have you back on, you know, if any point you're interested, um, you know, talk some ball. Uh, and, you know, when it gets close to the season, you maybe check out, you know, check on you, see how things are going. Um, would love to, you know, obviously we'll stay in touch, but would love to stay in touch, you know, on here. And, and you know, you're welcome back anytime. Well, I appreciate that, man. Thanks for having me. It means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. So that's going to do it. Uh, that is Kyle Slaughter right there. You can find him. He's going to be playing for the Las Vegas Raiders and I'm Jake Ellenbogen. Uh, we're signing off until next time. Uh, you guys can, uh, check this out on all platforms. It's going to save as a, just a regular video. This is the same to you, Kyle. Uh, you can find it on uh, YouTube, Facebook live. It'll be on Twitter, um, and Twitch as well. So thank you guys. And, uh, you guys take care.